as Democratic candidates try to get traction with Iowa voters, we have a brand new poll from CNN and the Des Moines Register laying out the state of the race. Here it is. Just five candidates hit above 2% in the poll. Joe Biden maintained his slot at 24%, Senator Sanders uh, and Elizabeth Warren and Mayor Pete Buttigieg are all virtually tied for th in a three-way race for second place, 16, 15, 14, respectively. Senator Kamala Harris comes in fifth with 7% before a sharp drop to the rest of the field. And I want to get straight to Iowa now for our exclusive interview with presidential candidate currently in second place, Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont. Good morning, Senator. Thank you so much for joining me. We have so many issues to talk to. But first, I want to get your, your reaction to what you just heard, our new poll in Iowa. You are uh, not in the second tier on your own anymore. Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, right there with you. And Warren is on top among liberal caucus goers. It seems maybe you've lost your position as the clear progressive alternative to Joe Biden in Iowa. Why? Well, Dana, what I think is that uh Four years ago, you know, there were only two of us in the race and we split uh, the vote about 50 percent each. This time we got a whole lot of candidates and I don't think anybody is going to reach 50 percent. But I got to tell you, we have an incredibly strong volunteer network here in Iowa. Uh, we just did several town meetings yesterday, large turnouts and the issues that we are talking about. The fact that the working class of this country is sick and tired of working longer hours for low wages worried about the standard of living that their kids will have, worried about climate change, worried that almost all new income and wealth is going to the top 1%. Those are issues that will resonate in Iowa. Those are issues that are going to resonate all over this country. The American people, in my very strong belief, want a government and an economy that works for everybody, not just the 1%. So we're not going to get 50% of the vote in Iowa. I don't think anybody will. I think we have an excellent chance to win here. We're going to win in New Hampshire, and I think we have a very strong chance of being the candidate who will defeat the worst president in the modern history of this country, Donald Trump. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the issues before us and Donald Trump in particular. He, of course, is touting a deal on Friday to avoid imposing tariffs on Mexico after he says Mexico agreed to increase its National Guard presence, dismantle organizations that traffic migrants, and return asylum seekers to Mexico more easily. Does the president deserve credit for that? Well, I think what the president uh, has done is tout what, in fact, in many respects, Mexico has agreed to do uh, many months ago. Uh, but I think what the world is tired of, and what I am tired of, is a president who consistently goes to war, verbal war, with our allies, whether it is Mexico, whether it is Canada. Uh, the issue here in terms of immigration requires us finally to do what should have been done years ago, and that is pass comprehensive immigration reform to make sure that our young, the young people in this country who are in the DACA program get immediate legal protection and that we have a humane border policy. We need a decent relationship with Mexico. They are our allies, as is the case with Canada. We should not be confronting them every other day. Philosophically, though, as president, would you be willing to use tariffs as a negotiating tactic on non-trade related issues? I believe that the trade policies this country, the United States, has had for many years were written by the CEOs of large corporations, often in secret, by the way. I voted against NAFTA. I voted against permanent normal trade relations with China. And I think what the facts show is that we have lost some 4 million good paying jobs as a result and of I, those disasters. And I understand that that's how you feel agreements. about trade. But what about the, the idea of tactically using tariffs on other issues to, to, to negotiate what, on other issues? You can't use it to threaten. You can't have a trade policy based on tweets. What you need is a comprehensive trade policies which represents the working people of this country and not just the CEOs of large corporations. So do we need to change our trade policies so that we protect jobs in America? Yes. Do we need to work with other countries to lift up the poorest people around the world? Yes, we do. But Trump's erratic threats and trade policies are not the way to go. Okay, so you talked broadly about immigration. You tweeted this week that President Trump's tariffs were a, quote, fake border crisis. 
in quotation marks. But immigration officials have arrested or encountered more than 144,000 migrants at the southern border in May, the highest monthly total in 13 years. Border facilities are dangerously overcrowded. Migrants are actually standing on toilets to get space to breathe. How is that not a crisis? What we need to do, I mean, what Trump has been doing, and I think the, what the meaning of that tweet is about, is that Trump has been demonizing undocumented people in this country. And that's part of his strategy about dividing us up. Before he was president, he was the leader of the uh, Bertha movement, trying to delegitimize uh, President Trump. He has been anti-Muslim. That's what his political strategy is. What we need is a border policy that is humane, that among other things, uh, expedites the asylum process by bringing in a whole lot more legal staff and judges. But what I so just described to you, to wait. is that a crisis? It is a serious problem, but it is not the kind of crisis that requires demonization of desperate people who in some cases have walked a thousand miles with their children. It is an issue that we have to deal with. But the issue of climate change, the issue of tens of millions of Americans not having any health insurance, the fact that half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck, those are more serious crises. So it is an issue. But you don't demonize desperate people. We deal with it in a rational and humane way. Let's talk, to, uh, talk about the issue of abortion. Joe Biden changed his position this week, opposes the Hyde Amendment, which prohibits using taxpayer dollars for abortion services. You oppose it, too. And you said this week that you have, quote, always voted against the Hyde Amendment. But you have actually voted in the past to support large spending bills that include the Hyde Amendment. Amendment. Is it misleading, Senator, to say that you've never voted for it? Well, look, sometimes you, in a large bill, you have to vote for things you don't like. But I think my record as being literally 100 percent pro-choice uh, is absolutely correct. Look, if you believe, as I do, that a woman's right to control her own body is a constitutional right, then that must apply to all women including low-income women. That is what I have always believed, and that is what I believe uh, right now. Okay, so the uh, I am very concerned. Go, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please. All right, and, and I am, you know, very concerned about the outrageous attacks that we are seeing in Alabama, Georgia, or Missouri, all over this country, uh, which clearly are trying to overturn, lead, lead us uh, to overturn Roe versus Wade. And let me say to you, Adana, what I've said many, many times, and that I don't have a whole lot of litmus tests, tests regarding Supreme Court nominees, but I do have one on this issue, and that I will never, never nominate somebody to the Supreme Court who is not 100% uh, defending Roe versus Wade.